Being a, a mom is the most important thing in my entire life. Outside, of course, being a wife to this one. There's no class on how to be royal. Being a wife to this one. But I, I don't see it as giving anything up. I, I left my career, my life. What are the key differences between Meghan's self-branding and her statements and interviews and speeches? Do her speeches and interviews live up to the high praise? To find out, this video takes a closer look at Meghan and Harry's website. On the website, we learn that Meghan is a champion of human rights and gender equity. Her lifelong advocacy for women and girls remains a constant threat in her humanitarian and business ventures. Just in case we didn't already know that, of course. And what exactly does this lifelong advocacy look like? It wouldn't happen to be more about advertising than advocacy, would it? Let's take a closer look at Megan Smartworks' speech. When I first moved to the UK, it was incredibly important to me personally to be able to connect with people on the ground. Funny enough, and purely by coincidence, it was just a year ago at the same time that I was working on a project in Grenfell with this woman at a community center called Almanar, and that's when we put together the Together Cookbook. So though this is a year later, and obviously this is fashion, not food, at its core, these are very similar projects because they're about women who are empowering each other. Women are encouraged to think of themselves as group members, first and foremost, who think and want the same simply because of the innate characteristics they happen to share. In advertising, this is common. So, on my visits to SmartWorks, one of the times that I went, I realized there was a little bit of a challenge in terms of styling for the women because we had a lot of donations, but not necessarily the things that women needed to have. I said, okay, well, let's try to work with what we have and make the best of it. And then the next time I went, you'll remember this, there was a rack of about 40 or 50 lilac colored blazers. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a great blazer. And I'm sure for someone, it's exactly what she wants to be wearing. By poking fun at the organization's implied lack of innovation, Megan can make her changes seem that more innovative in touch and impactful. Thus, it's doubtful, to say the least, that she's being sincere when she says, And I'm sure for someone, it's exactly what she wants to be wearing. But for most women, when you're going in there and you want to have a job interview and you want to feel your very best and you want to feel confident, you want to be wearing the pieces of clothing that make you feel that way, and not the leftovers that didn't sell from the end of the season. The leftovers that didn't sell from the end of the season. Yes, I'm totally convinced that she meant it when she said, It's a great blazer. And so when I thought about it in that personal space, I said, on a bigger level, what can we do with brands? And what companies would be, help, would be able to help us convene and come together to really build a collection for the women of SmartWorks that could be the pieces that they need to feel confident going into those rooms? This is sort of how we thought of the SmartWorks capsule collection. Is this message actually empowering? That you need to wear certain clothes to feel confident? No, that's a tactic that advertisers have used for decades to make people feel insecure or less secure about their clothes. When the truth is that real confidence, real empowerment comes from within. Um, so I think at the end of the day, I just want to thank all of you for being able to be here, be a part of this success story for these women. I think it's really key in this day and age that we remember it's not just about the people that you know that you're supporting. It's about the people that you don't know, that you may never know, you may never meet. As women, it is 100% our responsibility, I think, to support and uplift each other to champion each other as we aim to succeed, to not set each, up, set each other up for failure, but instead to really be there rallying around each other and say, I want to help you. The totes already sold out online. <laughs> um. Getting consumers to buy a product is getting them to buy the idea of the product, what the product connotes, status, confidence, etc. In this speech, people are told that they will be part of a success story. Be a part of this success story in this shared success story. The generic nature of Megan's recommendations and the absence of specifics are common in advertising. Because what does it mean to uplift, champion and help each other? That's completely dependent on the situation. If someone says something wrong, they shouldn't be uplifted, no matter what their gender is. 
However, that's the very essence of groupthink-based rhetoric, getting people to see each other as fellow group members and not as individuals who can be quite different from each other, despite their shared innate characteristics. Groupthink-based rhetoric is the perfect excuse not to take personal responsibility. As a result then, this sounds a lot more like how Megan wants the demographic to treat her, rather than a profound message that people can actually use in their lives. And this is something Megan has a habit of doing. In one of her empowering podcasts, she talked about not knowing the negative connotation behind the word ambitious until she started dating her now husband. Because obviously, it was because of ambition that she faced criticism. It couldn't have been anything else. There was no guidance, you know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. Nobody prepares you. No, no I mean, no, but even down, yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem. <laughs> that's me late at night Googling, how, what's the national, I've got to learn this. Megan then went on to talk about the alleged negative connotations of the word, as if it was suddenly a general message addressing a general problem. And you look at that and go, how have we culturally allowed that to be the case? There's nothing wrong with talking about a woman's success or her ambition. You used the word ambition just now. Oh, and it's a trigger word. Well, no, it's a, but it's a word that a lot of people have used. Why is it culturally we are equipping girls and women to think that if you are ambitious, there's something negative about that word? She did the same here. Yes, as you were saying, the Gina Davis Institute and Moms First released this report, and my husband and I, our foundation, the Archwell Foundation, help to fund it. Oftentimes as women, you may agree with this, the way that we see ourselves is reflected back to us, sometimes accurately and sometimes much to our disservice, yeah. inaccurately, in what we see in media. Megan's actually talking about herself, how she supposedly thinks she's portrayed inaccurately, but disguises it as a general problem, a general problem that she, as expected by now, doesn't specify. Megan has a habit of delivering messages that are so generic and cliched that it's difficult to see how they can be applied to people's lives. Lots of groupthink-based rhetoric, though. You can be the visionary of your own life. You can charter a path in which what you repeat in your daily acts of service, in kindness, in advocacy, in grace, and in fairness, that those become the very things that are recognized by the next wave of women, both young and old, who will also choose this moment to join the movement and make our vision for an equitable world reality. Other times, she can't describe what her advocacy is actually about, so she stalls with an overuse of fixed expressions. It's well known you've championed the empowerment of women and young girls and promoting their self-worth. How do you hope to continue that work with the Royal Foundation? Um, yes, I mean, I think that knowing that I've, I've just been here for three months, right? <laughs> and in that You've amount of time, for, well, but with that said, for me, it's very important to, once you hit the ground running, even if you're doing it quietly behind the scenes, which is what I've focused my energy on thus far, is meeting with the right people, meeting with the right organizations behind the scenes quietly, learning as much as I can so that I can maximize the opportunity we have here to really make an impact. Um, yeah, just, um... I guess we wait a couple months and then we can hit the ground running. Also, it's quite telling that when it comes to describing what her humanitarian efforts entail, she mentions a story from three decades ago, which isn't monumental in any way. And don't worry, I'm not gonna play the whole thing. When I was just 11 years old, I unknowingly and somehow accidentally became a female advocate. This commercial the tagline said, women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. I remember feeling shocked. So off I went, scribbling away to our first lady at the time. They changed it to people all over America. I was uh, 11 years old, about 11 years old, and I had seen a commercial on TV Megan's lifelong advocacy is almost exclusively tied to what benefits her, what benefits her self-branding. But let's not let a detail like that get in the way of what the website description says next. She's been named one of the most influential women in the world in rankings, including Time Magazine's Most Influential People, The Financial Times' 25 Most Influential Women, Variety Power of Women, and British Vogue's Vogue 25. 
Considering the excerpts we've seen, these titles seem totally reliable. Because titles don't lie, right? What else does the website say? I can't wait to find out. Megan turned her focus to the entertainment industry, later securing a lead role on the hit series Suits, which she starred in for seven seasons. And Megan hasn't missed any opportunity to mention this series time and time again, making sure that people understand just how successful she is, just in case it isn't obvious. Also giving up, giving, giving up <laughs> your nice. career. Yes, nice. yes. Yes. But I, I don't see it as giving anything up. And, and also keep in mind, I, I've been working on my show for seven years. Um, so we are very, very fortunate to be able to have that sort of longevity on a series. And for me, Suits is not what I ever thought my, I never thought my life would be that awesome. I never thought that I'd have a show that went for this long. That's crazy. Every day I'm like, there's a fruit basket in my trailer. <laughs> um, and when it was time to garner sympathy, she used the success as a stepping stone to sound self-sacrificing. I left my career, my life. I left everything because I love him, right? Yes. But I, I don't see it as giving anything up. Between filming, Megan traveled to Rwanda, India and other countries to support humanitarian missions. She served in key roles such as UN Women's Advocate for Women's Political Participation and Leadership, a World Vision Global Ambassador and a leading counselor to One Young World. I'm curious, what does it mean to support humanitarian missions? Surely that must mean a lot of hard and specific work, right? I went to Rwanda um, shortly thereafter to really meet with female parliamentarians because Rwanda has the highest percentage of female parliamentarians of any government in the world. 64% of their government is female, which is astounding and amazing. Uh, went to Rwanda for a field mission to meet with female parliamentarians in Rwanda. Uh, it's an incredible country which has the highest percentage of female parliamentarians of any government in the world. 64% of their Congress is female, which is amazing. amazing. Um, what does the work entail? What do you do? Yes, yeah, so last year, last February, actually, I went to Rwanda, which was incredible because Rwanda has um, the highest um, percentage of female political participants of any other country in the world, so 64%. It's the same self-promotional story again and again with no actual arguments as to what's great about this country's situation. Megan's only concern is the gender of the people she was paid to visit. Larry asked what the work entails, but he didn't get an answer, because what Megan describes isn't actual work. A leading counselor to one young world. No doubt, I'm sure that the audience will never forget her monumental speech, where she demonstrated her vast knowledge about this important organization. She's an incredibly powerful voice for gender equality. And I was invited to pull up a seat at the table and prove that I belonged. But one young world saw in me what I wanted to see fully in myself. They saw in me the present and the future. My life had changed rather significantly. I was now married, and I was now a mom. And when she finally mentions this organization as a literal side note, she does it with the most generic word choice possible. And just as a sidebar, earlier this afternoon, we sat down with a few of you delegates. And it was incredibly inspiring, the resounding themes that came up about representation, about inclusion. Inclusion compared to what? Representation compared to what? These are buzzwords without definitions, and without definitions, what she says is devoid of content. So once again, we see that titles don't lie. In 2018, Meghan married Prince Harry, becoming the Duchess of Sussex. Who can forget that? She and Prince Harry founded the Archwell Foundation in 2020 to support communities in need in both moments of crisis as well as for long-term aid. They're committed to their mission, show up, do good. However, in order to do good, you have to know what you're showing up for. What does a healthy social media environment look like to you in the future? What do you think about this work that your foundation is doing? Um, I, to be honest, I, would, I, don't, I don't know. As a dad, I don't know. Um, as a human, I'm not sure. <laughs> he doesn't know the solution at his own event about solutions to young people's mental health struggles.
How can they find solutions when they don't know what the goal is? So for us, it's just, what is the solution? What can we do behind the scenes? What do we continue to do behind the scenes? How can we work with professionals and experts to really figure out, in knowing this is not going away, how do we make it safer, better, more positive? So what are they doing behind the scenes? This expression, which is one of Meghan's all-time favorites, gives the impression that there's a lot going on without Meghan and Harry having to specify what's going on, since it's behind the scenes. What are they talking to these professionals about? What do adjectives like better and positive mean? Better for whom and why? All of this remains unspecified, but that doesn't stop Meghan from calling this a high-level conversation. And the more information we have, the more information gathering we're able to do, the more we can have these high-level conversations and try to move the needle a little bit. And in that, I think so much of it can come down to if someone is looking for something, please don't feed them the thing that they're not looking for that's going to harm them. Sure thing. I'm sure that big companies will get right on it, especially considering that they're able to predict exactly what their users aren't looking for and what will harm them. Because Harry and Meghan have made such precise definitions of what they propose instead. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, being a, a mom is the most important thing in my entire life. And um, outside, of course, being a wife. Um, if Megan thinks that it's simply about showing up, the many buzzwords and platitudes make sense. What she gets wrong, though, is that showing up somehow equates to doing good. Buzzwords and platitudes don't benefit anyone other than the speaker, because they make the speaker seem morally good or superior. In 2022, Megan launched Archetypes, a record-breaking podcast, exploring the labels that hold women back, which should really be exploring the labels that Megan wants people to think hold her back. She's a New York Times best-selling author, publishing the acclaimed children's book The Bench and Together Our Community Kitchen. Acclaimed. I guess they didn't read all the reviews. This is blessedly not a long book. There's no narrative to speak of. Merely a series of vignettes in which the relationship between a father and son is sketched out in a series of banalities and badly constructed rhymes. There's no story in the bench. Nothing happens. It's a long list of disparate statements. The ending of this website description is just as specific and profound as the beginning. Megan's a major advocate for mental health, family care, and gender equity. The Duchess hopes to be a cultural catalyst for positive change, reflecting her core belief that representation matters and that communities can be enhanced through learning, healing, and inspirational support. And now we've seen what it takes to be a major advocate. 1. Use the right platitudes. 2. Never give actual arguments as to why these platitudes are good. 3. Go on trips and call it work, or humanitarian mission even. Two questions remain. Why does representation matter? Where and in what way? And what does the last sentence even mean? Communities can be enhanced through learning, healing and inspirational support. Which communities? What learning and healing? And are the many platitudes and cliches supposed to be the inspirational support? In other words, what's going on here? The word community speaks to Megan's groupthink-based rhetoric. Groups are easier for politicians and advertisers to control. Thus, it's about getting people to view themselves as group members, not as individuals with opinions that might go against the group. By making herself seem morally good or superior, it's easier for Megan to assume the victim role and appeal to people's pity and simultaneously oversimplify the criticism she's faced as bullying in a quite manipulative fashion. So how have you been able to manage the seemingly endless toxicity uh, that comes at you? The bulk of the bullying and abuse that I was experiencing in social media and online was when I was pregnant. What I find the most disturbing, frankly, especially as a supporter of women, is how much of the hate is women completely spewing that to other women. And I cannot make sense of that. Maybe because people are individuals first and foremost, and their opinions about someone aren't dependent on the gender of said someone. Maybe because everything isn't simply bullying or hate. Maybe because people have ears and know groupthink-based manipulation when they hear it. Just an idea. Reading from this website has certainly been an empowering experience for me. I hope you feel the same. 
Click the like button and subscribe for more inclusive videos.